Greetings, Alex here again. Welcome to part three of the 32-bit printing series. I know there was a bit of a gap between the last video and this one, but if you watch the, the Q and A's, you know that I was sick and down for the count. And oh, anyway, that's in the past now, and we can finally move forward with this. And I make these videos. I prefer technical and informational videos because this isn't specifically a all-encompassing like 3d printing channel this is a technical channel providing you background and underlying information that's going to apply across the board rather than like spoon feeding you facts and opinions and while that means i'll probably never have a million subscribers and there's not a particular niche that this fits into and since I do a bunch of different disciplines, there's always going to be people that are like, Why are you doing a thing I like? Do the thing I like. Unsub. But getting back to the, this is what everybody's been waiting for. When it comes to a new paradigm, the question on everybody's lips is, so which board do I buy? And that's a really hard question to answer because I think the supporting information is what's important, not the thing in itself. It's like teaching someone to fish as opposed to giving them a fish. This is a teaching people to fish channel. So what I'm going to do is look at the state of affairs in general. Then I'm going to give an overview of just a smattering of different types of commercial boards that are available. And then like non-commercial DIY options just for reference and talk about some of the problems that are surrounding it that explain why we don't have this like explosion of next generation, like 32 bit boards how that ties into like market segments and foreign manufacturing, different design philosophies or business structure philosophies that drive the companies that make these boards and why it's not nearly as simple as it was with 8-bit. And as usual, I will put in time index in the description. So with no further introduction, let's get into it. At times they are a changing and they are a changing fast. So here's a quickie history lesson just to bring us up to speed on the history of desktop 3D printing electronics. I'll start us with what kind of set the ball rolling in the early aughts, and that was the RepRap project, which was a couple British professors with a little bit of grant money who kind of set the stage for everybody else. Now they took the unique position of making everything open source and took that 20,000 pound grant and managed to turn it into a multi-billion dollar industry. And I don't mean multi like two billion, I mean multi like 20 billion over the course of the last decade or so. And this machine right here pictured with Adrian is called the Darwin that really started the ball rolling and set a whole lot of precedents. They all ran kind of makeshift electronics and interface, and that eventually gave way to things like the Cells Mendel, which ran a, a quasi-integrated board that was just called the uh, RepRap motherboard, which in turn uh, gave way to the uh, Prusa Mendel and the i3 and all those other designs, running boards like the Sanguine Alolu, which was kind of a nested breakout board for an Atmel IC, and then eventually, it hit, kind of hit its stride with uh, Johnny Russell at Ultima Machines Ramps board, which we all either know and love, know and hate, or know and tolerate. That board grew out of the uh, advent of the Arduino Mega, which was a much more robust and powerful processor or you know prototype board with a lot more GPIO and integrated boards like the Ultima Machine Rambo, also designed by Johnny as well as other boards like the lower cost Melzi, designed by Joe M and Adrian, the Roomba board, which was designed by RepRat Discount, which you'll probably know from the LCD displays that you've probably used, as well as other philosophies like the Gen 7 board, it's completely DIY etchable if you would like, or smaller specialty boards like the NanoHeart, for example, which is kind of Sanguine Alolu-esque in its nested format. But the industry is constantly pushing forward, and as community source projects are wont to do, that soon grew into a whole bunch of different technologies that we started trying to integrate into these other boards. Some of them can handle it well, some of them can handle it not so well, but the fact remains that with everybody pushing onward and upward, it was only natural to want to move to another generation of processors. Enter 32-bit. Now there was discussion even 10 years ago whether they should just start with 32-bit, but the Arduino project was just so danged tempting. And that's not to say that manufacturers have not been using 32-bit processors at all. As we all know, the Malion or um, Monoprice MP Select Mini has been using them for several years. 
But the advents of different kinematics that are more computationally intensive, like deltas, as well as the desire for additional features and IO variety and number has pushed a lot of users to look for different solutions. And 32-bit is no longer in the realm of a single IDE with a unified source for all the libraries that everybody uses. Now you have basically anything you can stick in there. And there hasn't been somebody that really grabbed the industry by the nose and guided it, so sky's the limit. So there's a whole lot of different fragmentation, a whole bunch of different architectures that you have to deal with. And we also have to realize that as the industry has grown, we have have a lot more different use cases now. It's not just a bunch of smartletons etching their own boards and programming their own software to run these things. Now we have a whole slew of different uses. And anytime you're moving into another paradigm, especially one where it's so open, then as they used to say in the old time cartography days, there be dragons. In terms of source code, is it open? Is it non-commercial? Is it closed? Is the development communal or is it internal? Is it free? Is it paid? The form factor of your electronics, is it an all-in-one? Is it stacked? Is it modular? Is it upgradable and repairable? Or does it have a warranty, et cetera, et cetera? Then you have to think about all the different markets these days. Is it for developmental purposes? Is it commercial, educational? Is it for the enthusiast? Because trying to lump somebody in who can program their own custom bootloader or firmware with somebody who can't even program a VCR, that's a little bit unfair. Just think about somebody who is developing 3D printers who wants something that's flexible and changeable versus somebody who's in a commercial context that needs something that's dependable and has some kind of resources behind it. Then you have the enthusiast who might want to just make the fastest delta they can versus the casual who just wants to print buttons to sell on Etsy. So for like a closed source proprietary system with a warranty and a very narrow ecosystem of parts, that's great for somebody like the US Air Force if they're going to be prototyping models. They need something that's accurate, dependable, and repeatable and has somebody that could come and freaking fix it when it breaks. Whereas for somebody like this lunatic, that would be an absolute nightmare. But something that's a big, messy, hackable modular board is amazing. Like Victoria Beckham amazing on a dinosaur with lasers. But I am a nerdlington, so I can deal with boards that look like this. And yes, this does actually print because I'm not cranking out parts for the Air Force. So you can see that different strokes for different folks means that there may not be a correct answer to the one board that you should buy for your particular project, which is why I put these videos out. So you don't, you know, waste your money and frustrate yourself. Now I kind of wear my heart on my sleeve when it comes to open source. I think that's the way to go because if things are too locked down and the money is funneled into too few pockets and those pockets belong to shareholders instead of the people that are actually doing the development, then we don't get the big boom that we have in the last decade. But I fully recognize that there's room for open source, there's room for closed source, and there's room for all options in between. But these days open source has become kind of a buzzword, kind of a selling point. And reducing that down to just lip service and not really being compliant or opening up source but not letting you do anything with it or making it very difficult, that kind of goes against the spirit of the whole thing and it's a little gross. And I'm not getting up on a high horse and being preachy, it's just something I have to touch on because we will have to discuss that a little bit later. Because intellectual property theft and disagreement and thuggery has driven a lot of people from that first generation where we had the big boom out of the industry. And we've lost a lot of great minds and just eyeballs on things in the process. But therein lies some of the friction, because we know we are dependent on cheaper manufacturing in order to keep the prices of things, things down. Because in the open source world, um, all of the uh, development is done and it's just a matter of getting the actual thing out at a reasonable price. And we do run into some problems where you have companies that just make things like, uh, like you know, just electronic things. And uh, I don't know if you remember, I, I don't I think, was it like old El Paso or something like that? It was an old salsa commercial. And they showed a picture of a boardroom, like Stanley Kubrick uh, symmetrical style. And you had businessmen lined up on the left and businessmen lined up in the right. And at the end of this big long table, there was the, uh, the chairman of the board or whatever. 
and he says, gentlemen, shall we make salsa? And one half of the hands go up, or oven mitt, and the other half of the hands go up. Well, that's sort of the thing. So when you have manufacturing that's, uh, you know, shipped off to where it's cheaper, you run into situations where, like, they, they didn't do the development. They might not even know what a 3D printer is, but they're making boards for it, and the decisions come down to, like, some bean counters, or, like, you know, cost efficiency engineers, or whatever they would call these people where they're like where can we squeeze on some like subpar or counterfeit parts what can we kind of price down and hope that like built-in tolerance is going to be taking up the slack so it'll still be a functional board etc etc you know cheaping out on the thickness of copper traces and whatnot and there's been sort of a rub in like the open source world where you get something like the original ramps board that was meant to run off like a 12 volt atx supply and just do everything kind of borderline so like the the fets were like borderline good enough and like the traces were borderline good enough for a particular set of parts and then as people want to do more to it they're eating into that very small margin of error and then as the parts are cheaped down and the construction is cheap down that eats into the margin of error and you end up with like connectors that are bursting in a flame and mosfets that can't handle it and things like that but the flip side is you do get things a lot cheaper and like i said a lot of that comes down to crowdsourcing the development and testing and when you're talking about r d research and development time the initial price of the product, if they're going to put out a product, has to incorporate that R&D cost of all the people involved. And usually the early adopters or the enthusiasts, they tend to shoulder the burden of that financial cost and then prices drop after a while. So that's one of the big deals with open source here because there is no R&D cost to recoup. Both that and during the design phase, the end users are going to be the cooks that are in the kitchen. And you don't have an industry where the product leads the direction. You have an industry where the demand leads the product. Sorry, these edits are choppy. There's a truck backing up outside. Now, just like a lot of disciplines, where the money's being made is where a lot of like the scumbaggery takes place or just misunderstanding because this is a fairly new model. And some of these manufacturers, particularly the overseas manufacturers, they might not fully understand the open source world and what their responsibilities are. Because as we know, in the non-open source world, this curve works a lot differently. You see this big hump up here? That's what they're shooting for. That's your period of exclusivity where you're selling a product that's not anywhere else in the market or where it's protected by patents and you're allowed to sell it and nobody else is. Patents exist technically so that you can recoup your research and development time. But after that peak, then you get the drop after uh, the patents expire, competition comes in, they start selling the same thing cheaper, or they sell it with different features, the market gets saturated, and then eventually you have obsolescence. But in the open source world, the goal is this period of exclusivity and patents are not necessary because all the information is available immediately to everyone and the R&D is group sourced. So that's not a cost. You don't have one person locking a basic product out for a period of years. You immediately, if you want to compete in the market, have to start either adding features or adding quality. Instead of forcing people to buy what you have because it's all that's there, you immediately have to give the people what they want to get ahead. See, Prusa or E3D or any number of companies, for examples. That information then gets fed back into the market where more features, more testing, more R&D, and more quality comes out as a result. When you get somebody who's trying to cheat the system for a profit or just don't understand it, they're trying to simulate that period of exclusivity on their product via either scumbaggery or, again, misunderstanding. When you take from that well of communal research and development and you don't give back, and you don't post your design files or whatever it is that the particular license requires, then you're cheating the system. And if it becomes widespread enough, it breaks the entire thing and you have a whole lot of unhappy people. Do you hit that peak? The downturn is not necessarily in profits, although it is in profits as well. That downturn is also in new development. So if you want to maintain that new cheap development, if you want to maintain that community feedback and people building features into each generation that the community is actually asking for, then there are three things that have to be done. Either 
Number one, you cannot buy from those few bad eggs. So they're like, hey, why aren't we getting this money? And then the community makes it known that it's because they're in violation of the community policies. Number two, you can hold those few bad eggs accountable. And number three, if they don't know, and it's just an innocent mistake, and they're just getting used to this new kind of concept of market, you can educate them and explain that in the long run, it's better for their profits too. A fine example for that is Naomi Wu, or, or Sexy Cyborg as you may know her, who is a Chinese citizen and working over there as a kind of advocate for uh, open source. And she managed to put out the uh, the Sino Bit, which is a little microcontroller board that was the first Chinese electronics project that was certified by the Open Source Hardware Association. But she's also been working with a lot of uh, 3D printer manufacturers to explain to them that if they use open source intellectual property, they have to abide by the rules of open source property. And if they do it right, they can save themselves money in the meantime. I'll leave manufacturers out, but if you don't know what the discussion was, it was with a particular band of printers, and they were using open source files for their board designs and for their firmware designs, and then not re-releasing the source of their work with the changes, which is what you absolutely have to do. And they didn't realize that, first of all. Second of all, they were paying for that firmware. So they were actually paying a third-party company to develop the firmware for their machines that they were bundling with it as a binary file. And that company was pulling from the Marlin project, doing their own configuration, keeping their settings and changes closed and then selling it to that manufacturing company. Whereas you can cut that middleman out completely. And if you open your designs and you open your setup files and you open your changes up to the community, they'll do it for you for free and they'll test it for free. They'll make the changes for free, submit them, and then you improve it and put it out there to the wider audience. So it's beneficial every step of the way. The problem is when people want to bootstrap their business by taking that intellectual property, doing away with all the R&D time, putting out something that's open source, but treating it like closed source, not re-releasing the files, then it goes out to the public and causes a whole lot of friction between people that realize you have to keep open source open if you want these ideas to keep flowing. And people who were like, I don't care what they do, I just want a cheap board which in turn transfers the money from the pockets of the people who are doing the open source stuff and puts it in the pockets of the people who are taking from what there is and then causing a dead end in development. And since they're not doing any of the open source R&D or resharing, it just dies right there with that end product. But you get a cheap end product, so that's the problem. To put it another way, open source short circuits or hacks the contractor's triangle where usually you have to say cheap, easy, or good, pick two, you can't have a third, and it makes it cheap as well as being easy and good by distributing that load to volunteers who are giving their own time at no cost to make it happen. Another very important consideration is firmware support. You can have the best hardware and electronics in the world, and if you don't have the software support, it doesn't really mean squat. Alternatively, clever software on subpar kinematics and electronics can do wonders. Now, admittedly, we know that part of what's held the 32-bit board revolution back a little bit is that, quote, the firmware's just not there yet, end quote. But A, it's coming, and B, it is there, it's just not where we expect it. It's not like the 8-bit days where you were like, am I going to run Marlin? Am I going to run Repetier? Or am I going to run Teacup? Because of the fact that some of those defaults have been a little bit slow to transition, many other firmwares have popped up in place to kind of fill in the cracks a little bit. We just don't have that one big thing that you know you can go to. And manufacturers are hesitant to put out boards if they don't know if the software support is going to be there immediately or not. So just an overview of a few things that we have here. There is Marlin 2.0, which works across a lot of boards now, at least more or less. Then you have the Marlin 1 forks, you know, Marlin for Duo, MK4 Duo, whatever, or other Marlin forks. You have 
have smoothieware, which runs on a fewer number of boards, or you can fork it for your own. Same with RepRap firmware, or, you know, duetware, as some people call it, because that was developed for the duet board. And there's also Teacup, which you can run on just about anything, but it's written in plain C from soup to nuts, and that's, you know, if you've ever worked with it a little... There's also a few repetier hacks or forks that have squeezed in some 32-bit stuff. Custom firmwares that are like based on Gerbil or Sprinter with some custom UI stuff on top, like the Malion systems. There's Clipper, which is kind of a hybrid system. Replicate, which works on a general compute platform, and then various proprietary systems. So that's another area you have to consider at the moment, because it's not like the 8-bit days where you could just say, oh, well, if all else fails, I could just shove Marlin onto it somehow. But we may be heading that direction, so don't despair. So with all that brouhaha in mind, let's move on to looking at some actual boards that are available right now, what the different aspects and features are of each board, what firmwares they run, and pricing. Now, here's a chart that I'm gonna leave up on the screen while I'm talking about this, but it's a kind of a cross section of the industry. It's by no means comprehensive and all of this stuff is subject to change, especially with the ongoing trade wars from the US and China and all that kind of nonsense. But I have the name of the board. I have it by descending price. The first column for price is the price as it is. The second column is the price assuming for Trinamic drivers. Now, of course, you can replace those $30 worth of Trinamic drivers with like five or $10 worth of Allegro drivers or whatever and cut the price down. So that's why I put it in two separate columns. Whether or not it's open source, whether or not if it's open source, that's compliant. Whether or not it's 24 volts or more right out of the box, of course, these are all 32-bit, but I made a column for 8-bit so we could have the Mega and Rams comparison and include Clipper. What onboard drivers there may be, or whether or not they're external. The processor that's used on those boards, if any. And then the firmware that they're going to run, or at least the ones that they were advertised as running when I look them up. Again, let me emphasize, this is not a comprehensive chart. It's been something that I've been working on for like almost a year, and it requires explanation so that it doesn't look, you know, weird or skewed or weighted towards something or another. Now, all of the subjects that we talked about come to this moment. So when you're looking at this, you have to think of not just price, but availability, use case, the hardware that's on there, whether or not that hardware is changeable, flexible, repairable by yourself, or whether that has the backup of a warranty and a service contract, something like that, that you may be interested in, depending on what you're using it for, as well as kind of like ease of use versus flexibility, which leads also to the firmware that it's running. So let's look at price first, and hopefully all of those things will feed into an understanding of why these boards cost what they do. It's unfair to just look at this chart from the top to the bottom, and even though I know a lot of people's eyes are instantly going to be drawn to the bottom and say, what's the cheapest one? You have to consider what goes into that and what you're going to be using it for, as well as what your philosophies on keeping open source free and going, dealing with the community, locked ecosystems versus like the Wild West and all that kind of stuff. So as a comparison, if you look all the way down at the chart, we have the Ramps Mega Sandwich, the 8-bit classic system that all of us use as kind of like a baseline. And assuming like a $10 ramps and a $15 mega, plus the price of your drivers, like I said, I spec four Trinamics drivers in here. It could be like six drivers and they could be something else. You're looking at either, you know, 25 bucks or so, plus shipping, plus power supply. Don't forget power supply in this. Or if you're including those drivers, 55 bucks plus shipping, plus power supply. Moving up from there, I put a whole different category, which is kind of like the DIY thing. And you notice there's no pricing or anything like that because it varies so drastically. That's like the 32-bit breakout board or proto board plus, you know, min shield or, you know, modulars or modules or something like that. And that could be like, um, you know, an STM board, like a, like a Nucleo or a Blue Pill or a Maple Mini or like an ESP32 board plus port expanders or a Teensy Plus port expander, something like that. Because like I mentioned, th this is the sky's the limit. We have a lot of fragmentation, but we also have a lot of choice. 
So as those get supported, you have more choices and you can do a whole lot of crazy stuff. And a lot of those are being rolled into the Marlin 2 project. There's at least some basic support for many of those types of things in there. And I've contributed a bit to that myself, as well as some other people who you'll often see in my comments, who, you know, as we have time, we'll go in and pick at a few things, try to roll it back in or hand it off to one of the other developers and say, hey, I got this done in a, in a afternoon, so see if you can do anything with it, you know, that sort of thing. But getting into like the basics of the 32-bit boards, the cheapest option is still like, you know, that the hacky option, taking what you can get, what you have and putting it together. So the, um, the Dua plus the Ramps mod that I covered a little bit earlier, that's basically going to be your cheapest door into it. But on the other hand, it, as you saw in that video, is not without its problems. It requires a whole lot of modification. You'll probably have to switch the MOSFETs out on the ramps or buy a better quality ramps that have the good MOSFETs on there or use a level shifter or something like that. So again, that's personally trading off price for effort. How much does your time cost? How much is it worth to you? Next notch up is like the Gen 7 boards, which are 32-bit, but they're also in this weird niche category by themselves because they run teacup and it's a very minimal 32-bit processor and it won't really fit anything else on there. And it's not made for 24 bolts, etc., etc., etc. So getting out of the more hacky stuff and into like the entry level, like unified boards, we have things like the AZ SMZ Mini and the MKS S Base. I've seen both of those referred to quite a bit out and about in the wild, and they're kind of like a medium price point. The S Base has onboard Texas Instruments drivers, and we all know about the problems that that uh, come up with those. It's additionally even tougher to deal with when they're soldered to the board like they are. Of course, a lot of these have ways that you can kind of like jerry-rig uh, external drivers and that sort of thing. So again, there are hacks around that. It'll also run Smoothie Board, and it kind of runs Marlin 2.0 now. But these are kind of non-compliant or non-completely compliant open source stuff. I know there's an argument that like some people have like kind of reverse engineered the board and posted them online or posted earlier development files online. At one point, MKS did post some of the, uh, the layout and the schematics, and then they pulled them down for some reason, not knowing, I guess, that you can just dig back through GitHub's history and pull them out. And the AZSMZ Mini, like it's quasi compliant. There's a schematic that's floating around out there on the store, but all the rest of the files aren't there. So those both dwell in sort of a gray area. And I won't talk about that too much more because I think I hit it in the previous comments. And I'll leave that up to you how you want to deal with kind of like a uh, industrially or morally gray area. Speaking of gray areas, you'll notice that there's a gray box right around the, the, um, Dua plus ramps FD and that's because there were a few community members that wanted to make like the new ramps a ramps for a duo hence the FD and they started work on that on the forums and all the development was out in public like you know from beginning all the way until the end it's not really finished and there's still debate amongst members about whether they should keep that project going or not but we had the issue where like the businesses, foreign manufacturing that makes money off of just selling these boards, jumped the gun. They way jumped the gun, took a version one of the board and just started pumping it out there. And you can find that, but it's not safe. It hasn't had the, it didn't have the proper testing and like um, real world in the wild revisions. So there's a lot of modifications you have to do just to get that safe. But there are design files and schematics and everything out there for perfectly safe and well-functioning versions. They just haven't been picked up by manufacturing, so you can't buy it anywhere, at least not yet. I don't know if that project is going to continue, but it is out there, so I thought I should mention it. Then we have the stuff that's in, like, a little bit pricey area, but not too expensive still. The uh, GEEE Tech uh, GTM32 is an STM32 based board that is, it appears to be, completely open source, which we know that uh, GEEE Tech has had a, a, some problem with that in the past, but this one, you can find all the files online. And I, I think it's the board is called different things. It goes into some of their printers. Um, you can buy it separately. I've seen it a few places. It's not really widespread, I think just because of the STM32 processor that's on it and the fact that 
Uh, Marlin 2.0 is really the only thing that handles that at all, let alone well. And there are still a lot of uh, limitations in the firmware because the SCM32s are not the primary target for Marlin 2. That's kind of like a user labor of love add-on to it that'll, you know, get developed in the future as it picks up more. But as a result, there's some basic features that are still missing. And getting into, like, the LPC processors that are the target of um, Marlin, they kind of use the rearm, which is the next board up, plus the ramps, as the baseline for the new project. So pretty much any features that are there are going to be working on the rearm, sort of. And you can see the price with drivers is like 85 bucks, which seems a little bit expensive, but if you already have everything from your old system, the rearm was meant so that you could just pull the Mega out, stick the rearm in, plug in either Smoothieware or Marlin 2.0, and then just, you know, hey, you're off to the races. So you can knock everything but the 55 bucks, or now I think you can get it for like 45 bucks, price of the rearm off of that and keep all the rest of your system and not have to deal with it, which is actually pretty nice. Then we have going up from there, Clipper, and that sort of falls into the same category because you can essentially take, just like with the rearm stuff, your entire setup as it is, but instead of unplugging the Mega and plugging a, a, a rearm in there, you are keeping that all together and then buying a Raspberry Pi, doing a lot of the computations and the hard crunching on that, running it through Octoprint, and then back into the system where the 8-bit microprocessor really just spits out numbers to the steppers. So you don't have to worry about it not being able to handle the speeds and the features of the 32-bit stuff because that's all handled on a general purpose compute board, i.e. the Raspberry Pi. Now, the only problem with that is that obviously you need a Raspberry Pi. If you have one lying around, sweet. You just get another SD card, plug it in, you're good to go. But if you don't, it's going to cost you like 35, 40 bucks or so for, you know, the newest, latest and greatest Raspberry Pi on top of the cost of everything you have. So for the same price as your Raspberry Pi, plus you will also need your other SD card, plus you will also need other power supply, plus you will also have to set up Octoprint. You can always just buy a rearm and then just keep, stick with what you're used to. So that's sort of a six of one, half a dozen of the other in terms of price, but it is a fun project. And it's a great idea. It does have its issues, and they're getting worked out constantly. Now, it was a bit slim on features a little while ago, which is why I've been holding off on doing like a Clipper review and how-to video, because I knew that there were features down the pipe that were gonna come in soon. And just recently, they've added a whole lot of things like LCD support, Trinamic support, all that kind of stuff that people have been wanting. And it's maturing by leaps and bounds all the time. And the big issue I'm concerned about is the price of that Raspberry Pi and the fact that it's going to monopolize it for this use. That's a big piece of hardware to just kind of like have to buy just to try this out. So my experiments have all been with trying to use like a Raspberry Pi Zero or a Banana Pi Zero or one of the smaller boards that cost very little money and get it to run on that. A Clipper's pretty well optimized. The main developer is a sharp guy, and the project is promising enough that, like, I even contribute to their Patreon every month. The weak link in this chain is the fact that Octoprint is a little sluggish for a couple different reasons. Octoprint is basically a bunch of Python scripts, and some of the low-level things that technically should be running in, like, Assembler C are kind of running in Python still, or with a Python backend, and the way that it does the communications like send a command, get an ack, send a command, get an ack, tend to get kind of clogged up in the queue when you're printing faster. So that sort of negates a lot of the like, hey, we could print a lot faster and spit out a lot more steps per second with this. So I'm also examining options with that in terms of like using Repetier instead of Octoprint messing around a little bit with the octoprint code trying to find some like community forks with a bit more of like you know an efficient parser and those sort of things so stay tuned for that if it's something that you're interested in i don't know when i'll be able to get to it but those have been projects or those have been uh, experiments that i've been running over the last few months now out of that we have a couple things that are um 
just examples like I put Lurge in here because they have sort of like they have an ecosystem but it's also it's closed source and as far as I could tell it's not closed source stolen from open source it's closed source regular old closed source but it's 32 bit it's higher voltage compatible like 24 volt compatible it uses a uh, STM processor it has external sockets for your uh, driver boards if you're into that kind of thing but as far as I know it's not going to run Marlin or anything like that. And reverse engineering it to get a custom firmware on it will be a bit of a pain in the butt. So I threw that in there just for reference. Right above that in terms of price is like the Dua plus the RADs. And I know that's a fairly popular board. A lot of the folks that were working on like Ramps FD switched to RADs after the whole debacle with manufacturing ahead of time and things like that. The problem with RADs is that it's, uh, it's open source non-commercial. So you ha have pretty much like a source or two where you can buy the RADS board for, and you're not gonna see that go to overseas manufacturing and come down in price. So the price is whatever the price they decide to set it at, which is whatever their profit margin is expected to be. And that's a business philosophy choice. That's like whatever could be good, could be bad, depends how you look at it. But once you get over the price, it's a sandwich board, you know, RADS and Duo. So once you get over the price of like your, your existing, um, your existing setup plus clipper or your existing setup plus a rearm sandwich. It's a bit of a tough sell, but it seems to be well designed at least as, at least as far as I can tell without having one in my hands and uh, a lot of people tend to like it. Now above that, we have some of the open source boards that are a, a bit pricier. They're unified. A lot of them have built-in drivers and specific firmware that's developed for those boards. They have an ecosystem of like, you know, the, the uh, LCD displays that you can use and add-ons like Wi-Fi and things like that. The ones that we're obviously the most familiar with are the Duet, which runs RepRap firmware, and the Smoothie board that runs, well, SmoothieWare. And they are a bit higher in terms of price, but if I were specking out something like an entire lab or if I were, you know, specking an educational printer or something like that, that's would be some place that I would probably look first just because of, you know, warranty support and uh, specific firmware that's always going to work with that board. A unified place where you can ask questions and get tech support and that sort of thing. So you have to figure all of that into the price before you just discount it out of hand because it's a lot more expensive. The downsides would be, as we showed in the, the previous parts where you're talking about use cases, if you're a, a, a hardware developer for 3D printing or, you know, just a 3D printer, form factor developer, that sort of thing, it's a little tough when you have a board that you're locked into and you can't try other things out because you're basically designing around the board. You can't sort of change the electronics to fit your platform. And for somebody like me, who's always burning out driver chips and always switching things out and always trying different stuff, that's not really something that fits the bill unless I were just trying to make a machine that I know I'm not gonna change for a specific use case and sit it off in the corner and not mess with it. You also have the various uh, Panikit boards, which are very well built, and they have the, the smaller ones and the bigger ones and the modules that have add-ons for you know additional steppers and extruders and things like that. The one that I have listed there is for uh, smoothie wear. And if you're looking for like a smoothie board with like, you know, uh, modular interchangeable steppers for different cases and things like that, that might be some place you want to look. And then there's also the Ulta machine boards. We, we know they make like, you know, the INC, the INC Rambo and things like that. So they also have the Arkham, which is their 32 bit board. The initial, it was, um, it had the Texas instrument drivers built in, which I don't think is a great thing, especially at, at that price point and considering other boards that you can get, but they do have the Arkham 2.0 that's either out or it's, it should be almost out right now or something like that, that, uh, uses trinamic drivers and something like that is what I could see as being the basis for like, you know, Prusa 32 bit printers when they eventually go that direction. And it's a solid company with a good reputation and they give back to the open source projects, give them hardware support, things like that. So while they are uh, on the top end, as far as like pricing scale, so not that any of these are absolutes, but for examples, proprietary, Lurge and Malion, examples of like ecosystem or integrated boards where the firmware is more tightly locked to the system are like Smoothie and Duet. 
examples of open source boards that are just you know integrated into one big motherboard are like the Panicit boards, Ulta machine boards, and like GTM32 from overseas. And in terms of like open source and modular or flexible setups, there's a breakout board plus modules, like a DIY kind of deal, or you have like proto boards and shields or hats or bonnets or whatever you call it, like a, a a dua plus a ramps or like a rearm plus a ramps and then in the other category you have things like rads which is open source but non-commercial so you have one source to buy it from uh clipper setups which encompass a whole different group of things and then just completely diy things and over the course of months, I'm gonna to try to incorporate some videos of some of these boards, not necessarily reviews, but more like an overview and a, and a how-to and like, you know, a, a comparison as opposed to like a shootout or something like that. Because a lot of that stuff is the domain of other channels that are, are good at this and have manufacturer connections, whereas I'm more interested in the, the tech behind it, but I will incorporate some of that. So stay tuned if you're interested. So that's the story so far, and hopefully I hit on enough of those areas to give you an understanding. And while I, I know that you probably came out of this without thinking like, oh, this is the thing for me, the board for me, the system for me, the software for me, I would hope that it would give you an understanding of where these particular, I don't know, genres, subgenres, philosophies are coming from and then help you make your decisions within those categories and not have false expectations about one thing or another. So this video series will continue. I have a couple other like non 3D printing, non 32 bit type videos that I'm gonna put out in the meantime. If you dig what I'm doing, you wanna see me do more of it. There are support links and affiliate links in the descriptions below all of the videos. So until the next video, get out there and make something awesome.